Welcome to our Monday Sound Bites as we continue our series through the book of Exodus. And today we're finishing off the um, second half of the chapter 2 as we have been introduced to Moses having been rescued out of the rushes and taken back to the court of Pharaoh. Here's what happens next from Exodus chapter 2 reading from verse 11. One day, after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labour. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Glancing this way and that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. The next day he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, Why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? The man said, Who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed that Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, What I did must have become known. When Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. Now, A priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flocks. Some shepherds came along and drove them away, but Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. When the girls returned to rule their father, he asked them, Why have you returned so early today? They answered, An Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water from for us and watered the flock. And where is he? he asked his daughters. Why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. Moses agreed to stay with the man who gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. Zipporah gave birth to a son and Moses named him Gershom, saying, I've become an alien in a foreign land. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. See, one disadvantage of living in our modern world is that complicated things are made to seem so easy. We take technology like TVs or computers for granted, expecting them just to function when we switch them on with little clue about how they work. Diseases, which a generation ago were killers, we now expect doctors to instantly heal with wonder pills. We want quick fixes to our problems. We don't want things to take much work if we can avoid it. And modern spirituality demands God must perform on demand too. Instant solutions for everyone. Or God saves everyone in the end, says the universalist. Or God will heal you if you just believe hard enough. Um, So modern day salvation is often more a feel-good factor. Religion should help you realise yourself and give you peace. Free you from the pressures of the world. No wonder the real Christian message, where it's proclaimed faithful, faithfully, is not fashionable. For in Christianity, salvation is costly and painful and there are no quick fixes or instant results. Faith is a lifelong struggle to be faithful to a God who saves us at great cost. For ultimately, our rescuer had to live a life of suffering and struggle that ended in death to make this relationship with God possible. But why? Well, we've seen a little bit about why in Exodus so far in two reasons. One, serving God is a constant battle because the world will oppose us. So we have the tension in Exodus 1. God was blessing his people by making them miraculously fruitful. But on the other hand, the other part of God's promise wasn't being fulfilled, the promise of land and blessing of his presence. And actually, the extra fruitfulness had made life harder because the Egyptians, seeing God at work in the Israelites, began to fear them and enslave them and threaten them with genocide. You know, every boy that's born to you must be thrown into the Nile. So history shows us that there's always opposition to people who serve and know the living God. So the Bible's utterly realistic in proclaiming that wherever God works, man's self-interest and human rebellion will set itself in direct opposition. Serving God is hard first, though, because 
even though some submit to God's rule, there are always spiritual vandals, people who will just seek to destroy the faith and obedience of others. Not because they know God, but because they reject God. And so they don't want anybody else to enjoy him either. So there's a battle because the world opposes us, but also our life has significance because of the providence of God. And we saw that at the beginning of chapter 2. Moses' mother experienced this incredible providence. God not only preserved the life of her son who should have been thrown in the Nile, but she ends up being paid to nurse him, and he ends up being adopted into the family of Pharaoh as a prince of Egypt, the very Pharaoh who was attacking God's people. And there's always a purpose behind God's providence. And so that's where we pick up the story. Moses recognised in some way that God had preserved his life. He knew he was a Hebrew, presumably from his circumcision, and that God had a greater purpose for him, a sense he had that God was using him to save his people. But working out that calling is what the rest of this chapter 2 is about. What does Moses have to learn about becoming a saviour to his people? Well, firstly, he has shown very powerfully that salvation involves sacrifice. The saviour has to identify with his people. That's why it's going to be costly. So Moses had it all. He had all the education, the wealth, the power of the Egyptians, and yet he'd been born a Hebrew slave. You can imagine how he felt when he saw them. Verse 11 records how he went one day to his people and saw an Egyptian just beating a Hebrew, one of his people. They were slaves. They were subhuman to the Egyptian society. Perhaps he got a sense of injustice. He'd enjoyed the riches of Egypt while his people were suffering to provide them. But that day something clicked. He just couldn't stand by and watch anymore. And so he hit the Egyptian and killed him. Was it murder? Well, the text's a little bit amb ambiguous, for the same word is used of the um, two Hebrews hitting each other as well. He hit him. Maybe he hadn't intended to kill him, but what, however, whether or not it was premeditated, he certainly went on to try and hide it and hid the body. Maybe he'd only been trying to teach the man a lesson, but the deed was done. And at that moment, Moses took on the role of deliverer of his people. The book of Hebrews puts it like this. He chose to be ill-treated with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. It costs to be identified with others. For Moses, it cost all the luxury and privileges of an Egyptian prince. But for the greater saviour, the one which all of this points to, it cost the glory and the majesty of heaven and the intimacy of being the son of God. There can be no rescue or salvation until the rescuer comes to his people in sacrifice. The fire brigade can't save people from a, you know, from a burning building until the firemen risk and go and become into the building to go in and save them. So by identifying with the Israelites, Moses shows a desire to serve God more than himself. He sacrificed his own comfort to be obedient to the call. That's the first measure of salvation. Salvation involves sacrifice. But he also had to learn, secondly, that salvation must be an act of grace, of an undeserved love. Verse 14 says it all. Moses had risked everything, his reputation, his life, livelihood, to see justice done and to help the Hebrews. You know, no wonder he tried to interview when he saw one Hebrew hitting another. He'd risked it all to save them, and they were just doing the same. But when he confronts the guilty party in verse 14, what's he get? Who made you lord and judge over us? If the man had thought for a moment, he should have known the answer. How else had God had Moses survived the genocide and grown up in Pharaoh's court if God hadn't appointed him to this role? But rather than admitting his guilt, the man threatens Moses. Are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian? See, Moses expected his people to acknowledge his help, to desire his help, to be appreciative of his help to rescue them from slavery, but instead he was rejected. If you're going to save, the lesson is, it's going to be costly and will take grace and undeserved love because people don't want rescuing. Not if it means submitting to the rule of their saviour. See, our problem is we don't want to be rescued on God's terms. We want it to be on our terms. 
Rather than respect the justice Moses could have brought, the man wanted the freedom to go on being selfish. That's exactly what our problem is. Jesus died because only death can atone for rebellion against God. And without forgiveness, we'd, be never, we'd never be free from that rebelliousness. But here's the supreme evidence of God's love. While we were still his enemies, rejecting him, God sent his saviour into our midst to die for us. Salvation doesn't depend on how good we are, but simply on the grace, the selfless sacrifice of the Saviour. That's what Moses had to learn. It was going to be costly in sacrifice, but it needed to be gracious in self-giving love. But the third thing that he picks up on the story, and from the exile that ensues as he runs away from the death penalty for murder that Pharaoh was likely to instil, Moses learns in exile the true reason that salvation is costly because salvation must fulfill the promises of God in the life of the Saviour. See, Moses still has a deep sense of that justice. He longs to be able to rescue his people and God reinforces that in him by a well in Midian. There he rescues the seven daughters of a Midianite priest from the hand of some bullying shepherds. And once again, God's providence is seen. For he finds himself in the house of Jethro, not only in hospitality, but with a wife and family fairly soon. Now, the Midianites, they were descended from one of Abraham's concubines and worshipped Abraham's God. So, ironically, Moses, having been rejected by his own people in Egypt, finds a home with relatives in the wilderness. The Israelites rejected him despite identifying with them, but the Midianites accepted him, even though they initially thought he was Egyptian. Fulfilling the promise to unite the peoples. And so it's in exile that Moses begins to recognise that saving the people of God is not just liberating them from slavery. It means fulfilling God's promise to bring them into their own land. That's the point. His first son, verse 22, Gershom, means stranger there. Because Moses says, I've become an alien in a foreign land. Not just because Midian is not Egypt, he didn't mean that, it's because Egypt is not Canaan. The promises of God were needed to be fulfilled and that meant more than just stopping the slavery, it meant leaving Egypt and going to the land of promise. So salvation is costly because the promise of God often exceeds our desires for his grace. It depends on promises we may not see fulfilled completely in this life when God promises the glory of a personal relationship with him although we're given a pledge and a foretaste of it by his spirit we won't see the fullness of it until we see him face to face in heaven just like Abraham Isaac and Jacob Moses had to trust that God was going to keep that promise that he made even if he didn't experience it fully in the meantime and in that foreign land he awaited a promise of God to bring his people into a land of promise and blessing God's salvation depends on what he has promised to us, not just on what suits us. So while Moses is in exile, God is already moving things forward. We're told, verse 23, the Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. And God heard their groaning and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. Finally, God's people... When things had got really bad, remembered that God had promised them better. And in their slavery, they called out to God and trusting God's promises to bring them God's saving salvation. And so Moses shows us and learns what it takes to save a people. Sacrifice. Grace. And the promise of glory. And what he learns Jesus fulfills and we get to enjoy. So let's see how God opens up the first of those blessings as he comes to know God personally. But more of that next time. In the meantime, let me pray. God our Father, we thank you for showing us in the life of Moses something of what it cost you to become our Saviour. Yes, in the undeserved love that you have shown, in the call uh, of sacrifice in your death for us and in the promise of new life that we will see fulfilled when we see you face to face. 
Help us to hope for the glory that you've promised and shape our lives to trust the Saviour you have given, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. More from the book of Exodus next week. Take care.